My name is Lawrence C. Larry Holliday. I was born in Manning, South Carolina in April the 30th, 1919. I'm today, is my birthday, and I'm 90 years old. And I can't believe that I've lived this long. I don't take but one baby aspirin a day, and that's all the medicine that they allow me to take. December the 7th was the day that Pearl Harbor was attacked, and a friend and I had gone to Winthrop College to date two young ladies that were from Manning, and we were in Winthrop dating these two girls, and we rode up to Charlotte, and my girl said, my date, she was uh, from Sumter, South Carolina, and she says, you know, I've never been up in an airplane. And I said, well, come on, now, let's go to the airport. I'm going to take you up in a plane. So I went out to the airport in Charlotte, and the two, girl and I got in a plane with the pilot, and we went up to fly around, soar around, and while we were up there, he got a call, said all airplanes should go get on the ground as quickly as possible. And when, then a few minutes he said, Good Lord, it, Pearl Harbor has been attacked. And that was the first we knew of it. And uh, we, we landed, because we, we were ordered to land, and then we took the girls back to Winthrop and went on back to our hometown in Manning. I wasn't in school, I was through with school, and I, I couldn't go to college because I didn't have the money. And, you know, depression had just hit, it was just over with depression. My daddy lost everything he had, but he made a big comeback. And uh, I, later on in life, he was able to get a farm. i never forget when he came home one day, he says, my mother says, Walker, what are we going to get the kids for Christmas? He says, I don't know. She said, well, we got $500 in the bank. She, he said, we did have. At the church tonight, we had to raise so much money to close the church. So I gave him half of my money. She said, I believe you've lost your mind. In a year's time, he got a call, and the bank says, Mr. Holiday, we had to foreclose on the nicest farm we have in South in Clarendon County, and we'll let you have it if you can raise and pay off the mortgage. And he was able to pay off the mortgage, and when he and my mother died, I sold that farm I like $500 to get a million dollars for it when I sold it. Getting back to World War II, beginning of World War II, this man in, I lived in Bannon and he had a son that was a doctor up in Columbia. And he came down one weekend and I, my daddy ran into him and he says, uh, I, my name was Lawrence in Bannon. They never called me Larry until I got to the Air Force. But anyway, he said, you know, I'm going in the, in the medical detachment of the 118th Infantry, 3rd Division in, in, in Fort Jackson, and you serve a year and you get out. And he said, I think that's what Lawrence ought to do. Tell me, come on up there. Come on, tell me, come on in there in the medical course. Said, I'll take care of him. So I did. I went up and I joined the, joined the, the infantry, got in the medical detachment, and uh, my job. I was uh, getting up at daylight, the roll calls, you know, and one morning they said, uh, Helen said, anybody can type? And I held up my hand. They said, I can type. I said, well, you go to the office at such, such time. So I went to the office and I typed my way to glory from then on. But anyway, uh, my job uh, in Fort Jackson, I worked with Dr. Isidore Shower. He, he was a head surgeon. And uh, he, he was from the University of South Carolina. And he had to make inspections of kitchens. And I used to go around and follow him and write the notes, whatever he told me to write. And I'll never forget, he reprimanded me for spelling T-O-R, torn, T-O-R-N-E-D. He said, it doesn't have an E-D on a private holiday. But anyway, I served my year and got out. And uh, right after I got out, they were said, you either go back in or we'll draft you. So I said, good lordy, I don't want to do that. So I, uh, 
I got a bunch of fellas that we all went and joined the Air Force. I said, looked at those airplanes flying when I was in the infantry. I said, boy, that's where I'm going if I ever get out of this place. So anyway, I got in the, in the Air Force and I was sent to McDill Field and I took the examination to be a pilot and I flunked it because I was colorblind. They said, you can't fly, you're colorblind. So one day they, they said, we're forming a new field over at the, at the air base, no, at the, at the airport, and it's going to be called Drew Field. Drew Field. If you'd like to go over there, he said, I think it would be a good opportunity. So I went over there, and when I got there, they started, had me cleaning our exception tanks at homes and all. One day I went up to headquarters, and I went into the first sergeant, and I said, listen, I, I'm sick of having to clean out septic tanks and something. Can't you do something better than that? He said, well, when did you, when did you go to? When are you, how are you so smart you're going to tell us what to do? And the major sitting in the office over there, he was from Atlanta, Georgia. And his last name was Hart, Major Hart. He said, Sergeant, send that man in to me. So I went in there and he said, I heard you talking to your son. I said, yes, sir. I told him where I was from. He said, well, What's your, what's your biggest problem? I said, well, I believe I could do something better than clean out the septic tanks at home. Had a bunch of homes, veteran homes over there. So he said, well, uh, I said, I served a year in the infantry. He said, you know anything about morning reports? I said, I would know them backwards and forward. He said, well, report up here in the morning. So I report, and in the meantime, I'd have been a man down on the line that was a master sergeant. And he was very friendly to me. And, uh, one day he was a master sergeant, and the next time I saw him, he had major bars on him. I said, good Lord, major, how you get to be a major for a master sergeant? He said, well, I've been in the service a long time. And uh, he became my friend. So after I was up there working in the orderly room, he came in one day and he said uh, to Major Hardwick, he says, how's Holiday doing? He said, he's doing great. He said, I want you to make him first sergeant. And he said, well, he says, he's qualified. He's already served a year in the infantry. He knows what it's all about. And I jumped from book private to first sergeant. And that's the picture right there. <laughs> um, and uh, that was the story, the beginning of my life in the, in the Air Force. It wasn't long before uh, one day they said, uh, we, it was, the war was going on pretty good. and." My whole outfit, including my commanding officer, who was named Major Hal Doolittle, we all got shipped to Kearns Air Base in Salt Lake City to go overseas. Well, about the time that we got there, VJ Day was declared. So I went up to headquarters because you had to have 55 points you could get out, and I had 57. And I was able to get out there. So I went up and I, I walked in and I asked, I wanted to speak to who was in charge. And he said, there was Captain over there. His name was Captain Archer Stokes. I said, good look, good Lord, Captain, you were, you were staff sergeant to me in, 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 uh, in the Columbia, South Carolina at the air base, I mean, the field there. He said, I said, great Lord, how'd you get this high? He said, it ain't easy, but I'm, I'm here. I said, well, I tell you what, I want you to help me get off of this shipment. I said, I don't want to go overseas now. VJ Day is declared the war is going to be over with. He said, well, I don't know whether I can help you or not. So I, I left. And uh, so a little while, we were shipping out, and uh, we walked up to this train where we get on the train to go to, out to uh, California and uh, had a sign that said, through these gates, that's the best damn men in the world. Good luck, it said. So anyway, uh, I got up there and get ready to get on this train, and he drove up in a staff car. And he came out and he called me and says, I got you off the shipment. I said, good Lord, what are you going to do now? He said, well, that's your problem. And I called out a Sergeant Franklin, a tech sergeant in my outfit from Atlanta, Georgia, and I told him, I said, Sergeant, take over. I've got to go back. But I'll meet y'all in, out of California. And I went back to his office, and they said, we have an opening for a first sergeant in Portland, New York, on Miami Beach. 
And I said, well, give me Miami Beach. And I went back and got my discharge. I stopped by in Tampa, Florida to see the girl and the family that they work for the Tampa Tribune. And uh, I dated this girl for a long time. And her mother said, uh, Larry, where are you going? I said, uh, I'm going to uh, back home. I don't have an education. I got to go back to school. She said, well, how'd you get as far as you are? I said, it don't take nothing to be a first sergeant. <laughs> anyway, she said, well, my husband's got plans for you. Said he's got six hardware stores here in Florida, and he's hoping you'd take them over. In other words, if I married her daughter, I could have them. I said, well, thank you, but I can't handle that. And you know, I still talk to her, her, this girl's daughter in Tampa today. I just talked to her last week. So anyway, I went home and uh, uh, I, uh, oh, I went, I, went, I ended, enrolled in Clemson on the following February. And I served two years at Clemson in taking med, trying to go, I wanted to be a, a dentist, but I couldn't get into med school. So I quit, came back home, in the meantime, I met the girl that I married, and she was teaching Columbia, in Columbia, South Carolina. So I went back to school at the University of South Carolina and took a, a, a course in, uh, in business administration. And in the meantime, we got married, and uh, doing fine in school. She was teaching school, and all of a sudden, she ends up getting pregnant, so I had to quit and hunt a job. So anyway, I, we came down to, her family lived in Plattersville, a little one-horse town between Conway and Georgetown. And her daddy said, had a big old country store out there. And he said, well, I'm getting ready to quit the business. I've made all I need to make. He said, if y'all want it, take the inventory, you can have it. So we moved to Plattersville and we took over the store and I became a postmaster. And I served eight years as a postmaster. And then one day, I heard about the mayor of Myrtle Beach. He had, he'd built, a, a, he'd got the, the, the contract with Phillips Petroleum Company for the, a franchise. And he'd built a, a, a business a, a, for a business in Georgetown for his son to take over. His son up and died with cancer, I think. So I went to see him, and I said, Mr. Talabas, I'd love to have that business. He said, well, I don't know you. I said, well, I'll get all the information you want. So he came out to my store in Plattersville one day. He sat on a bale of hay, which I had a bale of hay to advertise for sale, you know, I had a bunch of hay to sell. My slogan was, we sold anything from fertilizer to hairpins. And uh, he sat there and saw me working in that store for a while, and he said, uh, Larry, you know what? I said, you, he asked me, you got any money? I said, no, I don't have any money. He said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna let you have that all business. And I'm going in with it, cause you, you don't have the money. So, and he said, well, I tell you what, what can we name that business? I said, well, I don't know. He said, well, let's call it H&T Oil Company, Holiday and Talavas. And I took over the business, and my first big customer was the International Paper Company. And man, they gave me all okay. kinds. They didn't buy a little loads of fuel. They bought 8,000 gallons at a time. You had, it was a big business. And, and then I met a man from the, one of the plantations. Can't remember his name, but he came in one day and showed me his credit card. And he was, he had signed his own credit card. He said, I used to be with Phillips and Oil Company. And I said, well, I'd love to have your business at your plantation. He said, well, you got it. And I got his count, and everybody followed. I, had, I, I ended up getting about every plantation in Georgetown business. And that was the start of my business in, in, out in the world. One day I had a, a, a one of the scariest things that would happen to me, one day my, I had a I had a commanding officer down named Major Kemmel. And he walked out of me one day and he said, Sergeant, I'm getting ready to take a friend. He just been transferred into 
this field. He's a major, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna fly out. I'm gonna we, if we go down to take an airplane. We go fly out and show him around this area. Come on, go with us. I said, all right, sir. So uh, we got in. Uh, we had an airplane that the fellas had built. It was a B. It was a B seven. No, it was a. It was called a flying coffin, and it had two engines. So we go out, we get in that airplane, and uh, we fly it over St. Petersburg, and flying around, doing fine. And it, 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 the, uh, the maintenance sergeant was with us, that took care of the airplane. His name was Sergeant Bottoms. I'll never forget it as long as I live. And we were out there flying around, doing fine, and all of a sudden one of the engines cut out. And we started going down. And, uh, and made, the Sergeant Bottom ran up there, and he, there was a second lieutenant, his co-pilot, and he said, told that lieutenant, get up, let me have that seat, let me have it. He got in that seat. He started working what for something like that. It's a guadal, a guadal pump. And, and switching, trying to pump gas back in to get it started again. We were in 500 feet of the water, and I was trying to put on a parachute. And somebody said, hey, don't you put the parachute on now, you ain't got a chance. But all of a sudden, the Sergeant Bottoms got that engine going, and we finally went back up. And we landed, and Major Keppel says, Sergeant, what openings have we got in there as a Master Sergeant? I said, I don't know, but we'll make one. He said, well, Bottoms just saved our life. I said, well, I'd make him a Major if we could. <laughs> anyway, I promoted him to Master Sergeant because he'd saved our lives. And that was a, about the biggest experience, the worst experience I had in, uh, in the Air Force. Very little. We could, back then, we could fly four hours a month and draw half of our base pay. And I, every, every month they'd call me and say, all right, Sergeant, you better come on down and get your time in if you want your pay. And I'd go down and fly four hours a month. And, uh, we drew, it, I drew $138, then I got half of that for flying, you know, four hours. And that was good money because a, a second lieutenant didn't make but 150 and he had to pay for his own housing. And uh, one day, I got a call, and, uh, and uh, they said, uh, his order came down from somewhere, said, uh, we understand there's a lot of administrative men been flying, getting base pay four hours said, I'm sorry to fold, but all of you will have to read for reimburse your money. So I went took that letter to Major Shrek. And I said, Major, look at this. He said, well, I gotta go to Washington in a few days and I'll take care of this. I'll, I said, who are you going to I'm going to see Hap Arnold. I said, who's Hap Arnold? He's a general. So he flew to Washington and he came back in a few days and he said, sorry, forget it. It's all taken care of. And so you see there's a lot of politics in, in, every, in everything, including the Air Force. I got back and was going to school and I went to Clemson. Then I went back to Carolina to business administration. And that's when I married my wife and she was teaching school in Columbia, and she was down here at a little old place called Plattersville. And uh, after she got pregnant, I had to quit school. I like seven credits to get my diploma from Carolina. I said, well, I'll go back and get it, but I ain't never worked for nobody but myself, so I never needed it. Anyway, uh, we raised our family at Plattersville. I was postmaster, and we had a wonderful life out there. And my oldest son, We'll tell you today, the best days of his life when he lived out there in the country. Because he had, they all had ponies and horses and we, everybody had a ball. And, uh, and after that, uh, that's when I got into the old business. My, well, a terrible thing happened to me. I had, my first child was a girl, her name was Gail. And she was four years old when she drowned at Paulie's Island. And uh, my, boy, my wife's brother was a major there. He was in the service. I can't remember the branch. But he came over 
after after serving a lot of time, and so we all went to Paulie's Island. We had, but my daddy, my daddy-in-law had six or seven homes over there at the time. We stayed over there. And, uh, he was, my little girl started crying, and back in those days he had maids, and my maid took her down on the beach to uh, calm her down, and he just said, hey, give her to me. And he walked out in the water with her to, to calm her down, and he ended up having a heart attack and fell over, and she couldn't, she couldn't stand up and, and drowned, and her body was going out to sea, and a man on the, on the fishing pier right by saw her, and he uh, jumped overboard, swam out and got a body, brought her back to the shore, and a man from North Carolina was renting a beach house from us. He handed her body to him, and he fell over and died with a heart attack. We had three dead at one time out there, and that was, that's about the worst thing ever happened to me. And uh, anyway, we had two more boys <laughs> trying to have another girl, and uh, finally we had a girl. So I ended up with three boys and one girl, and now they're all married, and I told them when they were coming up, I said, I'm gonna educate you, but if I got the money, I'm spending it. You ain't gonna get a dime. And all of them are doing real well now. <laughs> no problem. One's already retired at 57, the one that she interviewed years ago, and uh, the other one's, a, he's had a pharmacist in the hospital, and the other one's a dentist up in Greenville, and my daughter's a dental hygienist, and she works for us, her brother. And my wife was, ended up in a nursing home, had uh, three strokes. And uh, she caused it by not taking her medicine. And she got, she uh, finally, <clears throat> this year of October, I went to the doctor and they took care of it. I said, uh, Doctor, is Marty going to ever get any better? He said, she'll never get any better. I said, well, I think, what do you think we, so to speak, pulled the plug? He said, it's a good idea. And they moved out to hospice. And that's where they put her to sleep. And we all went to visit on a Friday night. Everybody was there but one grandchild who was at Clemson. And we all talked to her, sang to her, and you know, and I believe she heard us. And that night she died at 11.30. And it was right funny, I was on the highway commission back in the days, four years, and the highway commissioner from Spartanburg came to her funeral. He did, and he got back to Spartanburg, he called me the next day, he said, Larry, I want to tell you something. I've been to many funeral. But that's the first time I've ever been to an 87-year-old woman's funeral, and the, and the church was full, and it was. She was a great person. She had done a wonderful job for Georgetown. And uh, <clears throat> I miss her. I miss her a lot. A friend of mine, he was a Texaco job here, and I was a Phillips job, and we merged our companies together. And then we, one day a uh, fellow owed me a bunch of money with the garbage business and I said, I gotta have my money. And he said, all I can do is just sell you the business. So I bought the garbage company. And that's the most money making thing in the world is garbage. And <laughs> so uh, um, we, uh, I, I bought, I closed it out at the bank and was walking out of the bank and the Texaco job of Buddy Ruber walked up and I said, uh, buddy, I just bought a garbage company. You want to buy half of it? He said, I don't know about the garbage. I said, I don't either, but I got it. But anyway, we, we did great. And one day, Waste Management out of Chicago came in to see us. They flew into Georgetown in a lead jet. And they came to see us and said, uh, we've been in the garbage business for years. We're all over the, world, all over the country. And we're coming to Georgetown. And we wanted to know if y'all were interested in selling. I said, well, if I don't sell, you'll put me out of business. I said, yeah, we'll sell. So anyway, they checked, and my book value on the garbage company was 250000 So they came in, they said, uh, came back and said, what do you want? 
I said, we'll take 800 for it. They said, uh, we'll give you 750. I said, we'll take it. So we got out the garbage bin, but it was right funny. They sent a man in there from Greenville named John Hudson. He was, uh, he was on the board of the, uh, and to take it over, he said, we, you know how we like our garbage companies to operate, you take it over. And he became a great friend. And uh, his wife, he married this lady, a peace lady from Greenville, who is a very wealthy family. And she bought a plantation in Georgetown, bought it from the International Paper Company. It's called uh, right out there, on, right there on the Black River. And uh, he died with a heart attack, John did. And I went to the funeral, and his wife says, uh, Larry, don't forget me, because John did. So I, I've been seeing, I went to see her last week when I was at Greenville. But, uh, and uh, now I'm in a retirement center called the Lakes at Litchfield. And uh, this is the best place that I know to come and die. <laughs> and that's what I tell people. Well, it's the last place I'll be. I'll be it's the jumping off spot. And uh, I'm 90 today, like I said, and I'm still living. Ain't nothing wrong with me yet. So Lord knows how long I'm gonna live. I don't remember much about it, to tell you the truth. My, one of my wife's brothers was in New Mexico, and I think he was involved in that. It's unusual times today with a black president, and I think everybody, uh, you know, likes him. It's amazing. And uh, I, 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 I think he's going to do all right. I really do. And you know, his wife he had 10 people in your town. And uh, she's, she's making a better record than he is, I think. <laughs>